Well, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another week of Ranching Reboot. This episode has been sponsored by our generous patrons over on patreon.com forward slash Red Hills Rancher. One of them could be you next week. This week, as a kind of a follow-up to uh, the show a couple weeks ago with Don Schiffelbean, the new head of the NCBA, this week, we're going to go just across the, I guess, to the other side of the fence and with the new head of RCAF, Mr. Brett Kinsey. So welcome to the show, Brett. Hey, it's great to be here. Yeah, appreciate you giving us your time today. So um, before we, well, tell us a little bit about yourself and then uh, we can get into what RCAF is. Well, you bet. My brother and I have got a partnership here in South Central South Dakota. We've got a cow-calf herd and a permitted feedlot. Uh, Ten kids between the two of us and uh, cattle is my brother and I's full-time job. You know, we're... We're fortunate enough to have enough going on to be here full time. Uh, We do some custom feeding. That's kind of like a lot of people have uh, town jobs to support their their ranching habit. But we're lucky enough to stay on the ranch and do some of that, too. Good stuff. How how big is that feedlot? Uh, We're permitted for 3000 head. Okay, so it's not one of those nine hundred and ninety nine. No, we were, we flirted with that, but we were, you know, we're right along the highway here in highway 47. And I guess some of it getting permitted was my dad looking forward, just knowing that sooner or later, somebody was probably going to knock on our door because we had a lot of cattle around. So we went ahead and voluntarily did it. And uh, some days I think it's great. The other days, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of work. I guess I'm, it's, it's kind of ironic that the RCAF president is a CAFO operator. Some people try to make us out to be anti big ag, you know, big, define the word big in, in today's terms, you know, I, I don't know, but uh, you know, so we're playing the game, you know, we, there's a lot that goes with running a CAFO, you know, a lot of certification, a lot of bookkeeping. So and I, I would also probably say that, you know, a three or a 5,000 head quote farmer type feedlot, even though, you know, you might not like the label farmer, farmer feeder is, is kind of what I have in mind when I think of, you know, a feedlot that size, or maybe a little bit smaller where you're trying to grow most of the stuff that you feed in that feedlot on the farm, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. I guess we are the, we're the true farmer feeder. I mean, the manure goes on the ground, uh, we, we plant corn and feed it to the cattle and it's just the circle of life, I guess you would say. Yep. Very cool. Very cool. So how long do you say you've been there on the ranch? Uh, I've been here. I, I just turned 50, you know, other than three years in the army and four years at uh, South Dakota state university, getting a degree in animal science. And I was home most of the time then too, I guess. So, you know, pretty much my whole life. How long has the, tell me about the ranch. Has it been in the family for a while? You bet. We're the fourth generation. Uh, My brother and I have 10 kids between the two of us and they'll be the fifth generation. And uh, yeah, we've been here since Homestead. And that would have been probably what, like 1870s? No, it was a little later here in the Dakotas. I should know that. I know in the 90s, we got a 100-year centennial certificate for 100 years back in the late 90s. So I, I would guess it to be 1890. Uh, you'll make a liar out of me. I don't, I don't know when <laughs> that was, but it's been a while. I don't have Jamie to fact check me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's... Uh... That's kind of about when this part of the world was settled, late 1880s. 1882, 1883 is when when this part of the world was open for settlement. But they didn't really, I don't really know very many original families uh, that got the original land grant that still have land around in the area. As, As strange as that seems, I think most everything has been traded hands several times. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty cool. My, uh, great grandpa built the church in the little town you know which it's no longer there because they moved the highway and it burnt down you know 80 90 years ago and you know there's just there's a lot of history there 
some of that history I think we kind of lose when we lose that older generation because it's not always written down and they don't always tell all their stories. And you know, I think there's a lot of a lot of wisdom from two generations ago that I still wish were was available. You know what I mean? Exactly right. You know, that's today we find our country in, in tough shape. We find, you know, our ranch economy in tough shape. But as we look back at what our parents, grandparents, great grandparents went through, you know, like we, we just had a massive storm go through Eastern South Dakota and, it, you know, on into Minnesota. And it was one of those storms that picked up all the dust and it just looked like absolute Armageddon, you know, and it was reminiscent of the dust bowl. But when you think about how the generations went through things like the, the depression, world war one, world war two, the dust bowl, Vietnam, you know, just all the things throughout, you know, they, they didn't have air conditioning. They didn't have tight windows. They, you know, we're, we feel sometimes like we haven't progressed, but we maybe have as much stress as they do, but we're certainly more comfortable than they were. They're still buildings. There were still buildings around here 20 years ago that still had outhouses they didn't have an indoor toilet yeah the, the first house that i lived in was actually one that i think it was grandpa george built it wasn't the little you know 12 by 12 homestead house but the first real house that they built we moved into that when i was just a kid and it had an outhouse for the first few months that we lived there but then we got it changed over so i might be one of the last guys that uh got to use an outhouse just for a short period of time there's people in alaska a lot of people in alaska that, that i mean they can't have a septic tank up there so you know there's a lot of folks up there that use outhouses but it's not necessarily a common thing to, in the lower 48 for sure yeah especially you know knowing or you know being able to go to a business as recently as 20 years ago and there was an outhouse not indoor plumbing but you had to go outside to go to the outhouse that was uh that's pretty wild yeah so tell me tell me about RCAF what is RCAF well RCAF's a nonprofit organization uh 13 volunteer board members that represent about 5,000 members from 42 states. Uh, everybody sends their due through dues and, and volunteer donations. We have a CEO, Bill Bullard, uh, and four, I think four other full full-time employees that keep the I's dotted and the T's crossed, research, outreach, you know, but I guess, uh, you know, we deal strictly with profitability, viability, and freedoms to produce for the American rancher. And uh, I guess I, to put it really simply, we're the organization of people who take it upon themselves, you know, to fix some of these problems that we see facing rural America. Okay. So what are some of those problems that we see facing rural America? Well, the lack of a competitive market is probably the, the, the one, the foremost problem in my mind. You know, we hear a lot about sustainability, but I guess the first step of being a sustainable rancher is being able to have an income, you know, profit drives innovation, right? So right. all these innovative things that we hear about that we should be doing, you know, they have to be led by profit. And so, yep, profitability, you know, another thing, MCOOL, that's another big one. You know, they're, they're, it's interesting, they're, there's no one thing. It, it all works together, but, you know, a competitive marketplace, accurate labeling, uh, a checkoff that really serves the people that pay into it, I think is another very important thing. And then more and more we get into property rights, you know, the 30 by 30 plan. There's, there's, there's no shortage of issues as we dive in. It, you just said something about, uh, about the, 
the dollars being representing the voice of the people that spend the dollars. Um, I think that's true. I think that's true with RCAF, and I think that's also true with NCBA. I think NCBA um, represents well the the people that pay them the most amount of of dues. I would agree, but I, I have exception when they start saying that they speak for me. In some respects, yeah, NCBA does some good things too. Don't don't get me wrong. I yeah, it, it, this isn't. We're not we're not going to sit here and dog NCBA for the next hour. I mean, that, that's not, not at all what we're doing. I mean, they do do some good things, but at the end of the day, you know, it doesn't really seem like, it seems like they, they kind of cater to a very narrow, I don't know. They're looking for kind of a typical producer is what they're looking for. And the people that are on the fringes that are trying to do something different or that are trying, or that see what's going on with the markets, um, they don't seem to want to change any of that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would maybe even differ with that a little bit. You know, RCAF, we attempt to represent the independent cattle rancher, you know, that spread all across the United States, different production systems, different breeds of cattle, because, you know, you know what works for you. And in the background on, on your Zoom here, you know, you've got some cattle here that look very different from the cattle that I have up here in the Great White North. You know, and CBA to me, once they, mer once they let the Packers on their board in 1996 and NCA became NCBA, I believe that that changed their, their mission considerably it became more of the beef industry you know i'm a cattle producer i'm a part of the cattle industry they're more they have cattle issues that they address too but they do it a little differently because they have more of an industry perspective and i just feel that competition is healthy uh i think that the processors ought to have to meet us at the gate to buy the cattle that we produce and then they can go ahead and turn them into beef. And, you know, that's a respectful thing. I think that competitive marketplace for what we grow. So meet us at the gate. Can, let's unpack that. What do you mean by that? Well, we've, we've moved more and more into captive supplies, you know, really roughly when people think of ground beef, they think of 80, 20, right? 80, 20 is kind of interesting because it's so close to the numbers that we see often in, in the, the cattle and beef industry, you know, four packers kill a little over 80% of the 26 million roughly head of cattle that we slaughter every year fed cattle. So there, so that leaves 20% to all the rest of all the pack, you know, your smaller packers, your regionals, your, your mom and pop chop shops, whatever you want to call them. So 80, 20, and then further down the line, 80, 20, you know, almost 80% of the cattle are tied up in some sort of captive supply agreement now too, you know, so you have 20% of the people bearing the expense and doing the work of value discovery, and you're basing that other 80% roughly on the value discovery of the 20%. And that's unhealthy in my, in my view. 80% is also part of the Pareto principle. Like 80% of your effort comes from, or 80% of your results come from 20% of your effort. It's, uh, it's kind of what that says at the end of the day. I haven't heard that, but. It's one of those ranching for profit things. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what are some things that RCAP is working on to try to restore competition in the market? What are, what are what's your number one, what would be the first thing you'd do? Probably the first thing that we would do would be to reinstate MCOOL, not because it's maybe even the most important and it's not the one thing that's, that's going to fix everything, but because it's common sense. You know, the fact that, you know, in, in the mid nineties, we entered NAFTA and I don't know, that's what I would look at as the beginning of the free trade era. And that's when the idea of MCOOL 
but to allow American beef to differentiate itself to the consumer was born, you know, in, in back clear back in the late 90s, over 20 years ago, just as an ability to compete, you know, and it's putting your money where your mouth is. If, Amer if people really do want American beef, give them the right to choose. If not, they can choose beef from any of the 20 different countries from around the world that, that we import beef from. I seem to remember the late 90s that a uh, major fast food chain, because I don't want to get sued, was accused of bringing in and selling Australian beef and, and not, not being transparent about it. Do you remember that? Uh, vaguely. Yeah, I was in the army in Hawaii, and I remember one chain got E. coli, and it was a it was a pretty big to do. And I don't know if that intersected with what you're talking about or not. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, M M Cool, like I say, it might not be the most critical. You know, competitive markets I think are the most critical, but M M Cool plays into competitive markets too because it would allow American beef to compete with this imported beef, because I'm sure you know, you know, sometimes I assume that everybody knows right now, you can bring beef in from all these different countries, unwrap it, rewrap it, and you can label it product to the USA. And they, they would have you believe that that goes on a lot less than, than what we think. But I think the reality is that, you know, the actual import numbers show were uh, 2021 was a record year for imports. 2020 was a record year for imports. And 2022 is already breaking 2021 records for That's imports that. of beef. And exports aren't going up. I mean, that's that's exactly right. You know, we're. Uh, I, I get sideways when some of these analysts, uh, cattlemen's organization people say, no, we don't have any problems. You know, it's all the cattle cycle and we're going into the time when things are really going to get good. You know, I mean, you, you, you read all the time about how our cow slaughter is up, our cow numbers are decreasing and how good it's going to make it for us. But will it really make it that good if they can simply source that beef on a global scale and uh, unwrap it, rewrap it, call it product of the USA. You know, I, we, we fed some cows this year for a guy from Montana and he totally dispersed. He no longer has a cow. And, uh, you know, his perspective is, and it, it's a challenge that we have in this industry. As he said, what makes me want to get back in this? What makes me want to to buy cows again. And number one, it has to rain. I mean, green grass makes it a lot more attractive to have cows and those guys, God bless them, they're still fighting drought. Uh, but I won't sidetrack onto that. But, you know, if, if we as Americans, if, if we can't differentiate our product to compete on the world scale, I, I really don't know how much optimism we should have to play this game. And it it's important because the next generation of consumers is really, really demanding that level of transparency to know where their food comes from. Like they're getting interested in it. And that kind of gives me some hope. And at, on the same, on the same token, I don't see that the current system, you know, where you have the big mega, mega feedlots, 50, 75,000 head that they're pretty gross. <laughs> Uh, and you know, the, the big giant, um, big giant packing plants, I don't think they want the, the consuming public to see that, but the consuming public is going to demand that kind of transparency moving forward in the future. So that kind of creates its own problem. It, it does, you know, so I think that that's why we have to start addressing some of these things step by step. Number one, Let's label accurately. Let, let's lead with the truth. Let's stop the lie. Let's compel the truth. And that will set the stage so that American producers can have some competition for their product. And then, you know, we, we really have to dovetail into the competitiveness of the entire market 
as far as price discovery goes as well, because I see people wanting to, well, first of all, if you're a rancher and you have the ability to finish some cattle and you're not selling some freezer beef, you're crazy. I mean, anytime you put good solid beef in your, your aunt or uncle or friend's freezer where they know where it came from, you know, that's just a win-win because the quality's there. And I don't know. I mean, I, I think it tastes better when you know where it came from, you know, it's just a reassurance, but before we can really do the changes that I think some people would propose as the overall answer, which are smaller scale operations, we really have to fix the competition problem because the packer has as much power going out the back door with box beef as he has coming in the front door with the cattle. I mean, do you think that's a fair statement? You know, if, if that packer has that ability to come in and undercut, say, say you or I were to build a plant and it took off and it was really good and we began to expand and we cut in on a big grocery store chain, I believe with all my heart that the packers would come in with product cheaper if you ever got in that grocery store to begin with. You know, we, we, we have to address competition as a whole in this country. I, I agree. I, I keep thinking about that, that group that raised $300 million to build a packing plant in Southwest Nebraska. Uh, one of the big four is going to own it for 10 cents on the dollar within 10 years. I, I, that's just how I feel about it. They'll go, they'll, they'll, they have enough market power to manipulate the market. So I guess what's other than using the weapon of government to break up the monopoly power of the Packers, which, you know, that the weapon of government is not something you want to necessarily take out of that gun safe, like ever, because once that, once that cat's out of the bag, it's going to get used again over and over and over again with increasing frequency is, is that a tool that we really want to try to apply or is there other methods we could use to try to restore competition in the market? Absolutely. You want to try it. Hundred year old laws, the, the, the Packers and Stockyards Act of 1921 worked hundred years ago. You know, we, we get to thinking as Americans, sometimes we, somebody said this and I wish I could attribute it to them. You know, Americans with all this technology and knowledge and prosperity that we have, we think we can fly when in reality, we're just standing on the shoulders of those who came before us. Right. Have you heard that? I can't remember. Anyway, it's a good saying. Sometimes we need to go back and look at the fundamentals because fundamental truths are time eternal. And to me, antitrust, that regulation of competition, that is the government's job. It absolutely is. You know, the, the Sherman and Clayton antitrust acts that led to the formation of the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission, those were those were antitrust organizations at their inception because the government back then knew that we did we do not want pure capitalism we want managed capitalism we have to keep a competitive marketplace and because you know antitrust antitrust is the fertile soil of entrepreneurship to have a competitive marketplace where people can join in based on merit of production and not just merit of compliance to what the titans of industry tell you to do. Does that make sense? I, I, I really do. Yeah. I've, I've looked at it and I've come to believe it with, with all my heart that in the, in the 80s, you know, and I, I like Ronald Reagan. I'm not here to throw him under the bus. He did a lot of good things. But in, in the 80s is when we deregulated and we loosened our grip on antitrust. That led to an incredible amount of concentration. You know, in the way back in 1921, I wanted to say that the, the big four packers had about 70% control of yeah. the market. I, I think there was five. I thought there was five and the overall control was just a little bit less than it is today i could be a little bit off on that um but yeah it, 
I want to say it was five and they didn't have the market power that the four do today. Yep. But they, you know, basically there was an investigation by either the DOJ or the Federal Trade Commission or some combination of both. And they flat out found that the Packers were colluding to suppress prices. And that's when a consent decree was entered. And that consent decree basically made the big Packers at the time, back in the early 1900s, divest of some of the anti-competitive tools that they were using to suppress the market. And we saw that concentration fall from, you know, that 70% level down to 25 or 30%. And it stayed that way until the mid 80s. You know, and I, I was born in 1972, so I, I was young, but I grew up in the thick of the ag crisis. And, you know, I remember seeing all the sale bills and the, the local news flyers, you know, farm sales, liquidations, bankruptcies, the whole deal. But, you know, in that 80s, when, when times are tough, the guys with money do really good, right? But the guys who are trying to make money can't get anything done. And, and it was right picking for concentration to just blow up. And as they rolled back this antitrust enforcement in the 80s, we blew up from that 30% to, and by, the, by the time the 90s rolled around, we were right back up close to 80% again. So, I mean, just like that. And I, I just, I think that the, the concentration of the marketplace that's led to the AMAs and, uh, Laws like uh, M. Cool being repealed show that concentration in the titans of industry, it's not just all about buying product cheap and selling it high. It's about the political power that they are able to afford as they go forward. I think that's probably 95% of the reason we haven't seen any motion from, quote, the government to do anything at all about the meat packers there's just there's too much money that's being injected into campaigns and party donations and and whatnot that and and, it, and it's on both sides of the aisle don't get me wrong it, it's on both sides of the aisle um that there isn't a politician at the state or federal level that's going to speak out against how concentrated the meat packers are and take up a voice for us independent cattle producers there's nobody, I mean, the problem with independent cattle producers is we're independent. Like by nature, we're not necessarily quote joiners, right? Yep, that's exactly right. <laughs> and, you know, get any five cattlemen to agree on anything not related to cows or the ranch, you know, you might have a hard time. Get five of them to agree on a policy direction, much less 5,000. You know, it. I can imagine it's a difficult job. It is, you know, and that's, that's what we endeavor to do. That's exactly it, because I, I'm not here to whine about the Packers, number one. I'm really not. You, you've got to hand it to them. They're brilliant businessmen. I, I think the, one of the problems that cattle producers have is we confuse maybe ethics that might not be the perfect word to use, but, but we can we confuse ethics with business. And once you're running a corporation that has a fiduciary responsibility to return profit to corporate shareholders, ethics, and again, that might not be the perfect word, isn't necessarily your guidepost. It's what can you do? What can you get away with? How can you skirt the law or through the power of lobbying change the laws in your favor and i think that's what we're doing or that's what we're dealing with right now and you know it's interesting you say the ranchers we can't get along together because we're independent you know what makes us the best people on earth makes us hard to deal with but in my community and this is just an example that i've thought of because there's competition. I'm, I'm 30 miles from the nearest town where I'm sitting right now. Okay. And there's a lot of competition that goes on out here in the simple world, right? We compete for land and compete for who gets their road graveled first, you know? I mean, there's just, there's a lot of competition out here. But the one thing 
that makes my community come together because we're 30 miles from the nearest fire department is when there's a fire. You know, when, when we see smoke, everybody has some sort of fire wagon, trailer, fire truck contraption, and everybody goes. And I would contend that right now, if you're an American and you're a cattle producer, if you don't smell smoke, you can't smell. You know, we're, we're at that moment in time. And uh, I don't know, you know, we're, we're going to keep going. We, we wish we could attract more members. That's one thing that I wanted to say, too, is our calf membership is confidential because we realize that guys that are out selling cattle to these packers, you know, we, we heard it in the, the House and Senate Ag Committee hearings here just recently. They had people not show up for fear of retribution. And, you know, if you're trying to sell fat cattle, that's a very real threat. So hey, we could just ask Mike Calicary how that works. Amen. <laughs> amen. <laughs> I, I appreciate you said that, that our calf membership is anonymous. You don't tell, tell people who your members are. I'm not a joiner, but I did join our calf. They're a bunch of anonymous, man. Now you're out of the closet, just like me. At, you know, at, <laughs> if that screws up any business opportunities later in life, it's probably worth it. And it might not have been an opportunity I should have taken anyway. I, I hear you. I, <laughs> it, uh, you know, the, the threat is real, you know, but I guess if you're not willing to stand for something, where are you going to go? It, that's right. And, you know, I can make the choice to be an RCAF member. I can also make a choice to be an NCBA member, but I can't make a choice to pay where that checkoff dollar goes because that goes to NCBA anyway. That's so right. I can at least make a choice on, you know, what type of agenda I want to support with my membership dollars. And that's obviously what I've chosen to do. So we talk about MCOOL and... So here's, here's my recollection of it. And you've got a couple years on me, like six to be exact. I didn't see the eighties farm crisis. That was like, I came along and things were getting better out of that. So I got to, I got to kind of ride the good times or what we thought were the good times at first and that first wave of kind of consolidation when, you know, and things started to get good after that initial farm crisis. So uh, okay. Yeah. M cool. I remember that being a thing. Cause I, that came about just before I joined the Navy country of origin labeling. Cool. We're going to get to know where our meat comes from. I know that's going to be good for the cattle producer. Eight years in the Navy. I didn't really pay much of attention. I got out and you know, they repealed M cool. Okay. Well, that was, then we start, then I start doing a little more research and learn more about it. Well, we didn't repeal MCOOL for anything else that was in that original bill other than for beef and pork. Why do we do that? Well, Congress got scared because WTO representatives from Canada and Mexico threatened to sue. I mean, do I have this right? Do you remember all this? Yes. So the question is, who are these representatives to the WTO in Canada and Mexico? And who, uh, who'd they work for to go to want to bring those lawsuits? Like, that's the number one question I have is who actually threatened to bring that lawsuit? Because like, they didn't actually sue, did they? It was just a threat. Yeah, it went to a, a WTO panel. You know, there were three members on it. One of them was a... Uh, a Mexican national, you know, that was ruling on his own, you know, usually there can't be a conflict of interest would, there. No, I mean, exactly. You know, I, when I think of everything you just took me through, you know, when, when I talk about the big four processors power in DC, okay. This, this political power, their game plan is always to delay and dilute. Delay and dilute. You know, you look at MCOOL, we enter this free trade world, right? And 
I, there's nothing you that in Kansas can do to stop it. Nothing I can do. So we're in a free trade world. These people come together, get together for M cool, you know, and it was multiple organizations that fought hard for M cool. If, if my working from memory, I want to say that M cool became law in 2002. Okay. And there's a lot to learn here because it became law and it was contentious because the Packers didn't want M cool. And so it sat there as law unfunded until I think finally in 2009, it got funded and it became law. The World Trade Organization had a problem with it then, but I'll be darned, they came back and they actually made it stronger. So in 2013 is when MCOL actually had some teeth in it and became strong. And, you know, as fate would have it, it lined up at a time when we were down on cows, you know, at the bottom of the cattle cycle, I guess you would say. And a lot of people say that MCOL is not why the market went up. It's because we were down on cattle, but I would... I would rebut that by saying that we were down on cattle and they could not bring foreign meat in to fill that domestic hunger for beef. And that's what brought it up. Uh, you can't tell me that the traders on, on the CME don't look at things like MCOOL and think, hey, you know, this is kind of a game changer. This, this should increase the value of these American cattle because, I, you know, the funds did, the funds always the CME always runs prices too high and then runs them too low. But, you know, I, I believe that M cool definitely had a lot to do with our good prices in 2013 and 2014, you know, in 2014, 52% of the retail dollar flowed back into rural America. And I yeah. saw ranchers that felt guilty oh geez they're gonna people are gonna quit eating beef it's gonna get too expensive this is horrible you know i mean selling these dollar 72 fat or uh yeah it was i think dollar 72 is where right around there is where fat cattle peaked in rural america you, you couldn't find a new stock trailer you couldn't find a new pickup you couldn't find a new gate i mean everybody was buying everything because they had all this pent-up demand from years of suppressed prices and finally they could do those improvements so two you know, years they're... most guys made more money than they made in 20 definitely definitely i got to see what it felt like to operate with black money instead of red money, right? <laughs> Everybody thinks it's green, but to me it's red or black. But so yeah, you know, we're talking about M cool. I just that's such a lesson in politics to me about this delay and dilute. That's the it's like it's just like a basketball game. You know, if you get ahead, what do you do? You slow the game down so the other team can't score enough points to win. And and they're just they're masterful at it. Uh I wouldn't say that I admire the Packers, but you sure as hell better respect them because they're very good at what they do. Very good. Yes. Yes. So is there a remedy to M cool? Do you think we'll get it back? S2716. It's in the, it's in the Senate right now. Uh, my Senator actually introduced it. John Thune. Uh, another little political lesson my state legislature in South Dakota passed a resolution through the Senate and the House of South Dakota that directed our, our DC Congress members, senators and representatives to reinstate M. Cool. And uh, I'll be darn John Thune, it took a couple of years to actually get the bill written and get it right but he did introduce it. And so Senator Thune from South Dakota and Senator Rounds, and I wish I had the list here of the others, but I believe we've got 10 or 12 co-sponsors in the Senate. And it's also been introduced in the House. I'll get you that number. You can put it in the show notes because we really need people to call their congressmen and their senators and tell them that they care where their food comes from. You know, the American people make an investment in the safety of America's food supply too. You right. know, they pay, they pay the taxes that employ the FSIS workers and USDA to oversee the meat processing here, which really is the, 
it's the safest in the world, I'm led to believe. And uh, so they have that investment too. I, I think they've absolutely earned the right to know where their food comes from. I, everything else has a label on it, but again, sometimes you can't always trust the labels because that's only as good as the company putting it on. I, and I'm, I'm thinking about a story I heard sometime last year about a South American company buying blueberries, sending them to China to get them repacked, send or like buying them, sending them to China to get processed, sending them back to South America to get repacked and then shipping them up here and calling them a product of like Bolivia or whatever. Like it was just, it was organic and it was like an organic, like an organic fruit berry or something like, huh? Well, they can get away with it with that. They'll get away with it. They'll do it with anything. You know, and some people say, oh, nobody cares where their food comes from. If that's the case, why did they label everything product to the USA? Why don't they just leave the label off? You know, which, which leads me to the lukewarm effort, which is to redefine what made in the USA means, but make that label voluntary. To me, that's just what we'll see come out of that is, is that beef will no longer have an origin label when it comes out. It will just let that USDA inspected sticker. You know, it shouldn't be a research project for consumers to know where their meat comes from. You know, we pay a lot of taxes. There's 100,000 employees at USDA. It should be a no brainer. If, if that gets printed on there, it should be correct. And so that's what I see coming out of that lukewarm effort just to redefine what product of the USA is. I guess uh, Washington, D.C. is a complicated place. Maybe we really do need a bill just to define what made in the USA is. But uh, I, I also think that we absolutely have to have M. Cool to compel the truth. It's not just enough to stop the lying. We need to compel the truth because, like you said, everything else has a label on it. And, you know, we've, we've got to believe the labels. We've got to believe we need to be able to trust the labels. And that goes back to a transparency argument. Okay, so we have we have our meat labeled. Maybe we put a code on it, a QR code, a barcode, or a digital code that we can trace back, you know, voluntarily to the ranch where that animal is birthed with all the records of that animal, like whether it ever got antibiotics, could even be moves in between pasture every time it got a weight record. Do you think maybe customers would like to have something like that? I think that's where your niche market goes. Once we fix, look, I'm as frustrated with government as anybody. Okay. I mean, sounds like you're a veteran. I'm a veteran. You know, I. We've seen it from the inside. Oh, yeah, but I mean, in a positive light, you know, we, we really, freedom and prosperity is not the default status of everybody on this earth, right? I mean, we owe a lot to this country and the people who came before us to get us here. And the state that this government is in, I hear so many people that are disenfranchised and they say, government's not going to fix anything. And, you know, if we sit back and just let it go, they're right. But the problem is, is if we don't fix government, it's too big a parasite. It will take us all down because government just keeps growing and growing and growing. So really, I don't think we have any other choice but to uh, find our, our mutual agreements and to go forward together and demand some accountability out of this government. Back to where you were going with that, that individualized you know, tracing I think that that is a place where the niche can go, but yet I also think that we have to fix these larger competition issues again to make sure that that soil is fertile for this entrepreneurship. I, there, it's a life raft is what it is. And if you have the ability to get in that life raft, I say you get in it and you go, but yet I think of these Montana cow-calf spreads, you know, that are very good at running cows, 
and selecting bulls of proper genetics and raising those calves, but they don't have the grain out there, you know, that they would need. It takes, I'm lucky here because I'm on the edge of the corn belt and I'm in the grasslands. I'm, I guess I'm, I, I live where people couldn't make up their mind, you know, we're, we're good at raising cattle and we've got fairly good crop production. I'm in that spot. So that would be possible for me if I were a good enough businessman and I'm not going to contend that I would be to launch something like that on my own. But for the person that can do it, that's great. But I would warn when you start talking about ideas like that, it makes me think of this mandatory ID push that's going on. And it frightens me that maybe the big packers have that in mind. Maybe they're going to jam that level of accountability down our throats and it's not going to be a value added. It's going to be a minimum standard. Yeah. I don't, don't make any mistake. I do not support compulsory tracing yep. like as a central database. I support transparency from the producer side, as long as the producer owns the data, not, not a central government database. Like, uh, like we heard about last week with Alex Johnson in the UK, man, they register everything, every sheep, every cow, every pig has a number. And like, if one dies on the place, you can't just go bury it. You can't just leave it. You got to take it. You have to take it to a disposal place and pay them to get rid of it. I, I, we don't need that here. We don't want that here. That has no place in American agriculture. Voluntary transparent traceability back to the pasture of birth. I can get behind that as long as a consumer has access to the data and the producer owns that data. Hey man. Yep. That's, that's exactly right. Yep. And you know, for the person that has that level you know, you have to be a businessman to make all of that come together. And uh, I just, I don't like that getting confused with the larger effort that we fight at RCAF. You know, it's like in those congressional hearings, I hear about the billion dollars that they gave out for these small plant startups and stuff. And uh, I, I know that some of that money will find a good place. And I know that some of that money is just going to get feathers in the wind and some and until, of it will go to build big nice medium-sized plants that the big four can snap up at 10 cents on the dollar yep yep Thank you know you American like the, taxpayer like you mentioned the guys in nebraska that are starting that packing plant you know god bless them man that's an undertaking that's a huge undertaking and I hope and pray that they don't get gobbled up by the big four, but I think that even they will benefit from competition restoring measures for this entire industry. I really do, you know, because those guys, I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's, it's easy to come up with cattle to slaughter, right? That makes you a hero because you're a new place to get cattle a hook. And I'm not going to say that it's easy to get a plant built, but it's possible. And it's not easy to find employees, but it's possible. But where do you go with the meat out the back door if you don't have a competitive marketplace for that meat as well? You know, we that's that's what I worry about for them. And I, I haven't talked to them and I don't proclaim to be sharp enough to help them in any way. But I just think that competition is the rising tide that raises all vessels in this country. I agree. So what do we, how can we get that second or third buyer into the sale barn to start making those competitive cash bids? Well, we'll open a can of worms there. M cool. Are we good on M cool? Sorry. I chase rabbits bad. My, my That's kids fine. just holler bang. Right. I think we're, because, we're I think we're good on M cool. Like we can agree that, you know, that we need to know where our meat's from. We I, Yep. And, and there's a bill, you know, there's uh we we've got one more thing on M cool. 
it was maybe in the thick of COVID, a bunch of us got together. It was more than just our calf. It was like that grassroots beef producers page. I can never remember exactly the name of it, but just a bunch of us got together. It was pretty non-denominational and we, we started a petition, you know, demand USA beef. And we, in a short amount of time, we had 400,000 signatures on that petition that people do care where their food comes from. So, I mean, you can go to labelourbeef.com and that will take you to the website that will explain the issue of mcool far better than i can probably even and it will update you on the things that we've got going on it'll have a list of the people who have sponsored and co-sponsored that senate bill give you the number for in the house because we really do need people if, if you're disenfranchised with the way things are you know, this country cannot continue to be a spectator sport. We've got to get involved. And it doesn't mean packing up and going to DC and buying a suit and all that, you know, just pick up the phone, make a call. Like in South Dakota, what, what I think kind of started this whole ball rolling was that South Dakota state resolution that gave attention to it, that got our senators involved. And so Sometimes you just have to start at the base of the hill and work your way up. So I'd really urge people to go to labelourbeef.com and boy, we could use, you, you can't overestimate the power of a phone call to your house member or your senators, just to let them know that you're a consumer, you work hard, you deserve the right to know where your food comes from. I don't know what your experience has been, but my experience has been, I leave a lot of messages with staffers and I wonder if the guy ever gets to hear him or see him. You know, I've been told that they count every one of those. Okay. And that's, that kind of takes the stress off people to calling in, right? It's like, yeah, well, I do deserve to know where my beef comes from. I'm going to call them. But then they get to thinking and it gets a little overwhelming if it's something you've never done before. Like you just said, a lot of the time, you're going to get a voicemail. Just leave your message. But they count those. And, and that, that's how their barometer of what's hot and what they need to be paying attention to at any given time. And I've been told that 10 calls in a week to an office can move an issue. 10 calls. So it just takes people to get engaged and let them know that you're watching and that you care. And uh, so let your heart not be troubled. I usually on, if I leave a message, I will ask for somebody in their ag staff to give a call back. And that's kind of, I, I say, I am in support of S2716 and I would appreciate a call from your ag staffer. My number is leave your phone number or an email. Email is a good way that a lot of us communicate now. And that's a good way to get that back and forth started. A guy could probably just write like a stock email, change a couple words and then send one version every day for two weeks. Yeah. You know, and, and we do that. We'll, we'll like on that labelourbeef.com, I believe there is a template. And it's not that we think that we have everybody outsmarted with exactly the right words or exactly the right message, but it's just a guidepost for people to kind of know what gets that message across when they call, you know, so they're welcome to use that template or just to speak in their own words. You know, it's, you, you can do me and the American beef cattle industry a tremendous favor in two minutes, you know, and that number is 202. 224-3121. That's, and that, that's just, a DC area code. That That's a DC switchboard. You'll call and you'll either get a human operator or a machine that will say state. And you'll say, like in my case, South Dakota. And then it will ask you if you want Senator Round, Senator Thune or Dusty Johnson. And you might have to press one, two or three. And that will direct you to their office where you'll either get a person or a voicemail. And, uh, and it's, it's really, it's that simple. I, 
well, I have enough Bluetooth apparatuses around. I'm going to have a museum, right? Because they worked for a while and they quit. But that's part of my day when I'm in one of the tractors that's quiet enough and I have cell phone service. I just call and check in and be kind. You know, the person you get a hold of on the other end is probably a 22 year old college intern that that knows nothing. But, you know, just have a conversation like a good human being, be polite, but be firm and uh, leave a message. And that's that's what activism looks like. Just a small step. For sure. For sure. I, for, I started to get kind of frustrated and I guess I'm guilty of of not uh, not continuing to pick up the phone and make the calls. But every once in a while, I think about it, you know, I'll see a news story, I'll get upset, you know, I'll call my Congress critters, I'll call my senators and, and leave them some more angry messages about what I'm upset about. But it, I feel like I got pretty discouraged because of where I'm at. And, you know, I can see the big campaign donations where they go to and where they come from, you know, the big four donated to all our Congress critters and all our senators. You know, several of the big feedlots have sent in, you know, two, five, ten thousand dollar donations. I, you know, I donate ten bucks to the Libertarian Party. Like Pat Roberts ain't gonna listen to me. <laughs> I hear you. It's it's, and you are at a tough spot. I mean, it's it's not like South Dakota. It's easy, and they just do what I want, right? But yeah, Kansas is it's in a traditional stronghold of big ag control. But uh, there again, if you, if you know a state lawmaker, it's amazing how you can turn that relationship into something, especially with something like MCOOL, that's absolutely common sense. That's why I started with MCOOL when you asked me about issues. It's common sense. Can, can a country long survive if you can't, if, you, if you, I mean, the, the three pillars, right, are food security, energy security, and national security. Without any one of those, the nation falls. Well, and, I'd argue without food and energy security, there is no national security. Exactly. There any three. Take away, you know, look at Ukraine. You take away national security and the farmers can't farm. You know, the fuel quits flowing. Or, I mean, you take away energy and you can't have national security and you can't farm. And, you know, and, until we get back to basics, it's common sense. It's just common sense. And we have to get back to common sense. And that's what M Cool is, is common sense. It's a, it's a great first step. And I mean, especially when you understand a little bit about the history of M Cool and that delay and dilute process that they use. You know, they've delayed M Cool for a long time. Finally, we get a bill back, and then now you have efforts trying to dilute it. Oh, we just need a better a better definition. Or I think NCBA wants a processed in the USA label, which I mean, come on processed in the USA you, you you're bringing beef in from Namibia Africa with a total different food safety protocol and uh, you think because it's further processed in an American plant that changes the the life of that animal that created that beef come on probably didn't do a whole lot for the producers in Namibia either well, no, you've got people starving and they're shipping us beef. You know, it, it doesn't, if you ever get time, if you really want to chase a rabbit tail, look up flying toilets. And flying I, toilets. I don't, yeah, I don't want to be, I don't want to sound cold. Okay. Because I just said that America, I'm thankful for America and, and the standard of living that it affords me, but I, I Googled Namibia just for the fun of it, because I knew that we had, had cleared imports into this country from Namibia. And the first thing that came up on whatever search engine I was on was flying toilets. And yeah, it's gotten their sanitation problems in some areas of that country. I don't, I'm not making a blanket statement, 
were so bad at one point that people no longer ran into the bushes to relieve themselves. They would use a plastic shopping bag and hurl it back into the forest so that they wouldn't have to go in there. But, you know, <laughs> I, I, I just, I just don't know how we get to the point where we're shipping beef in here from around the world. I think an argument would be made, oh, well, we need to buy beef from Namibia to support Namibian beef ranchers, but it doesn't, I, I would bet you my last 65 cents that we're not supporting Namibian beef ranchers, that they're, they're in just as bad a shape as a typical American rancher. And it's one of the big four packers that's, that's getting all the benefit from that. And they might they're employ happy. a couple hundred Namibian workers at a packing plant or at a feedlot, and that's that's their economic benefit. Meanwhile, thousands of Namibian farmers and ranchers are starving. I would guess there has to be a story there somewhere. And again, I don't mean to to down to to run down Namibians. You know, I mean everybody. I mean, Brazilian beef is great. Australian beef is great. I'm sure West African beef is great. That's great. Keep it there. Eat it there. Let's keep American beef here and eat it here. Um, but then I guess that there's there could be an argument to be made about carcass balancing, you know, for consumption patterns. And I don't know if that's ever going to be that much of an issue in the beef industry, but that was something that came up um, on last week's episode in, with Alex in the UK is like in the UK sheep trade, I forget which way it was, but like they do a lot of carcass balancing, like they have to export sheep to somewhere and then import sheep back from them because of, you know, the difference between ground and the difference between like, like steaks and mutton chops, things like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess that would be like now saying that we need to import lean trim to mix with our white fat off of our, heavy carcasses in order to make hamburger for food service right i mean that would be that's the lie isn't it i think that's the lie i've heard <laughs> yeah i i would agree but that's not what we're importing no no some of that is no doubt about it i mean some of it is that skirt stuff but i mean yeah we're, we're importing everything i mean and Most everything labeled grass fed you're going to find in a store is probably imported well, sadly, and, you know, they've had their labeling problems, too, with that. You know, I mean, the, the American grass finisher wants to set themselves apart. So for sure, especially yeah. against, you know, um, Australia and New Zealand. Again, nothing wrong with beef from Australia and New Zealand. As long as you're on Australia and New Zealand and you're eating it there. Yeah, it. It becomes a shell game, I think. You know, uh, I, I often wish that Canada and Mexico had some sort of an RCAF organization because I think, like with MCOOL, I think that if, if we really could step back and have some perspective on it, I think that the big four, you know, they're global corporations. They're, they're playing the Canadians against us. They're playing us against the Canadians. I imagine it might be the same with Mexico. You know, you, you heard anecdotal stories of when American ranchers were sitting on 1,600-pound fat cattle that should have been killed six weeks ago, and the trucks were still rolling down out of Canada getting kill slots. It makes you wonder what gives, you know, and again, that's anecdotal. I don't know if it happened or it didn't. I'm not making crazy allegations, but, you know, it wouldn't surprise me because I, I think that that is a part of the shell game, whether it's between regions in the United States or from Canada to Mexico, or from Canada to the United States or Mexico on up. I, I, but the answer to that really isn't that complicated. We just have to call it what it is. That's a critical first step. That's what MCOOL is. It's that critical first step to calling it what it is and letting the guy that's writing the checks who ought to be running the whole show decide who he wants to reward with his dollar. And to me, that's just 
as simple and common sense as it can be. And, you know, I, I really think that a lot of people should feel pretty complicit for letting this lie go on as long as it has. But I'm going to have a drink of water and calm down now because I start to get <laughs> a little wound up and that's not good for anybody. Okay. Well, I got a, I got a little bit of a list here on other things that we can get wound up about. Um, Fisher Grassley, 30 by 30, 5014, contract library. I'll, I'll, I'll take 5014 for 500, Pat, or whatever. No, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, and there, there again, during, during those hearings, so let's go on 5014, I'll write it down, because like I said, I like to chase rabbits. We had the plant fire. That was the first air quote black swan. Then we roll into COVID and that was the next black swan. We have uh, the JBS hack and other black swan. You know, it just goes on and on and on. And when we have these hearings, that's what they want to talk about is that those are the issues that have created the spread between the fed cattle market and what the consumer is paying for beef. But if you look at the charts, that, that spread began to grow clear back in 2015. That was when we saw the uncoupling between what cattle are worth and what beef is worth. And so that's what at our calf that we try to stress that that is due to a variety of factors. It's not just supply and demand because of some black swan events. And, you know, it's directly attributable to this rise in AMAs or captive supply, whichever way you want to put it. You know, it stands to reason that the, the less the packers have to compete for cattle, the less value discovery we have the more ability there is for four packers to manage, you know, a, less than a million, I think it's between seven and 800,000 ranchers, four packers to manage 80% of what those 700 and some thousand ranchers produce. And I think that that's what we try and get forward. That's why that, that Chairman Scott in the House Committee I was so relieved to see him put up that chart that showed, I don't remember if it was Packer profits or the spread, which one it was, but it shows that this didn't start after the Holcomb fire. This started clear back in 15. You know, we're not in our second or third year of depressed prices. This has been going on since 2015, you know, over seven years ago. Yeah. And, and, and so 5014, I'll stay on that because okay. I'll, go chasing my rabbits. That was 5014 was launched in response to the newfound interest that Congress had in what was going on with that spread between the retail price and the cattle price. And as we visited with people, it just became, again, common sense that a majority of the cattle should undergo value discovery which should once again couple this incredible United American demand for beef, export demand for beef, you know, demand was off the charts, exports were off the charts. We should have been having good years, but we weren't. And the ability, again, to use the government to create a minimum standard of conduct, which that is kind of the government's job. That's one of the basic functions of government, yeah. You know, to create, standards. to create some value discovery. And, you know, to our delight, it went pretty good. We were pushing really hard, not just us, us and several organizations, several national or uh, another ca national cattle organization, National Farmers Union, I believe, Dead 5014 policy, uh, a couple of these state affiliates, Iowa Cattlemen's and Nebraska Cattlemen's, I believe, had 5014 policy. We had 10 sponsors at one time on Grassley's 5014 spot market protection bill, and we thought we were going to get somewhere. But then somewhere along the way, the wheels came off. One day we were going for 5014 and it was going good. 
And then out comes the Fisher Grassley compromise because 5014 is not going anywhere and the compromise is the best that we can get. And uh, that is the story that I really want to know is who decided, who wrote that compromise? How did we all of a sudden go from a very strong bill that was a couple pages long to a 20 page long bill that you know, 5014 was basically each packer, each plant that has to report under mandatory price reporting. So they have to slaughter over, I believe, 125,000 head a year is what makes them have to report on under mandatory price reporting. Has to procure 50% of their cattle from the cash market and take delivery within 14 days. Simple. Simple, straightforward, minimum standard of conduct, easily enforceable. It was a law passed by Congress that would then be handed to USDA to administer a law. But then, like I say, somewhere we changed horses and Grassley's bill that had 10 co-sponsors was married with Fisher's bill that had five. And they threw away virtually all of Grassley's strong provisions and went with Fisher's more vague positions. You know, the, the Fisher, the, the new compromise bill essentially hands it all to USDA with a few guideposts along the way. But there is just so much ambiguity in that bill as I read it. It, it scares me to death because... I have not given up all hope in Tom Vilsack, but he has a lot of challenges to get going on here in a short amount of time. And uh, I just think whether you like Tom Vilsack or you don't, truth be known, here in a few years, we're probably going to have a new secretary of agriculture. And uh, those guys aren't elected. So you don't want to put too much power in their hands because they're beyond accountability. So, so that's my little narrative on 5014 and the compromise bill, you know, how, I don't know how we got from one to the other. We can dissect the compromise bill more if you want. Where yeah, do you want to? Let's talk about that compromise bill. What's well, first off, let's talk about what's in it, what it'll do, and do you think it'll actually go anywhere? Okay. What's in it? Well, basically, we have five major cattle trading regions right now, and it will instruct the secretary to break those five regions into seven regions to encompass the entire continental United States. Then it will use, so we're regionalizing the United States. We've been reporting regionally, but this is really going to regionalize the United States because it's going to create reporting specifications and cash trade minimum provisions for those seven regions. Are they all going to be different or the same? Different. Okay. And that's kind of where I have my problem. It's one thing to have USDA create reporting data within regions, but once you empower USDA to determine what a competitive market is, that frightens me. That yeah. creates a very powerful entity for the cattle market. Of unelected bureaucrats. Yes. Now we, we talk and, and my big reason with that, it isn't that I trust or distrust. It's the simple fact that concentration creates market power and political power, as we spoke of earlier. And those guys have offices in D.C. and they're in and out of the doors every day. And I, I don't think that I can compete with that. NCBA might be able to, but I don't know with them being an industry organization if I could entrust them with determining what a competitive market is either. 
I don't know if I trust you to determine what a competitive market is. I mean, amen, brother. That's a mouthful. <laughs> did, did, did you ever want to work for me? No. You, you want your future to be determined by a competitive market, right? Yes. Yes. That's, that's what got us here. Entrepreneur, entrepreneurialism. You know, it's, here goes, here comes a rabbit and you shoot it if you want to. But when you walk in, if you know Mike Calicrate, you'll know this because Mike Calicrate's the reason I knew to look when I actually went in the USDA building in Washington, D.C., but above the main entrance, it says the husbandman who laboreth must be, I can't remember if it's must or shall, be the first, the husbandman who laboreth must be the first partaker of the fruit. I think that's right. So as you think about that, to me, that's a testament to the, the power and motivation of individual entrepreneurship, right? Yep. As long as the guy who's growing the food sees a future and sees progress and has a market, He's going to, he's going to keep at it. He's going to work hard. You know, a, a much less famous guy said, you can't work a person harder than they can work themselves. And that was my dad. You know, that's, that is the power of independent agriculture. And I would say actually family independent agriculture is that entrepreneurial ship that spirit, that drive, that's what keeps us going forward. I mean, as we fight through droughts, as we fight through blizzards and heat waves and, you know, everything that every generation of agriculturalist has fought, that's what keeps us going is, is that drive. So back to USDA. Yes, USDA is going to have the power and they're going to take input from organizations and they're going to have comment periods. But if you've ever commented on something, you know how that goes. That can, I don't know if the average person has the ability to influence the Secretary of Agriculture through a comment or not. But uh, they're going to use the, the cash trade averages from 2020 and 2021 as the initial baseline. It'll take a couple of years. That's already kind of flawed to begin with. I couldn't agree more. Okay. That Go was, that Go was the era of CFAP and PPP, right? Yeah. To survive. And as much as we all hate government money, without that, a lot of us probably wouldn't be here, you know, with the, 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 cat, the cat, cattle price wreck that went on. Uh so it'll take up to two years to establish the minimum trade percentages based on 20 and 22. And then I believe they have another couple of years to revisit that. And according to trade economist data, organizational input and a public comment period, they will have the ability to raise those percentages, but not lower them. Okay. So, and, and that's the, the shiny part that people hold on to is that even though this bill in terms of competition won't make it any better, it will keep it from getting worse with the ability to someday maybe make it better. But that's the same USDA that oversees labeling, that oversees Brazilian imports coming in here. You know what I mean? They, they have yeah, a lot. Yeah, of I problems. understand what you mean. <laughs> yeah. You know, the track record hasn't been real great for independent agriculture, even though they have that chiseled above the entrance. They sometimes seem to have forgotten that. I would bet that probably less than 1% of them read it or ever have read it. Probably don't know it's there probably don't even know it's there yeah, yeah i would agree with that yeah so uh, go ahead no that's that is the gist oh and uh it can't go higher than 50 percent. 
that mandated cash trade provision cannot go higher than 50%. Not more than 50% cash trade or not more than 50%? Not. Cash trade. Okay. 50% is the most the the minimum can be. Do you think that 50% cash trade is going to be adequate price discovery? I do not think there's a man on earth that knows what a government should set a level at. I believe that our energy needs to go towards PNS enforcement and reestablishing a competitive marketplace. But what that number is, I don't know. But I know that a lot of these practices, you know, we've seen so many studies come out. We have seen the Karstensen study come out that kind of attacks these other academic studies that have said that, no, these AMAs are good. They're, you know, everything's fine. We just got to keep going with it. We've seen the ISU CARD study, Center for Ag and Rural Development study, right out of Chuck Grassley's home state, come out and say that, I believe since about 2000, I won't say the date because I don't remember exactly, but in recent years, a lot of this spread has widened because the plants through modern data processing have learned to run, not the plants, the corporations have learned to run their plants on a group level instead of an individual level. And, and the, the result of that has been, you know, the big four, let's say the big four each had five plants or six plants. Well, there used to be 22 or 24 plants that were trying to kill cattle, buy cattle, kill cattle, source cattle, keep the floor moving, keep everything rolling. But now we've moved to a more organizational approach where maybe if you have five plants, one or two of them won't run at full capacity. So the other three and other regions can make more money. You understand what I'm saying? They're running it more on a, a corporate profit bias instead of individual plants. You know, it used to be if you had five plants, you'd have five managers. Every one of those managers had to report and say how the plant's running. But now maybe that manager is there to take the report and see how he should be running that plant to best make money for the corporation instead of for his individual plant in any given spot. Yeah, turn it down, you know, either turn it down or speed it up to control capacity in that market to control the price. Cause if it's just you and one other guy that are selling beef in a 500 mile radius, you can, you can start messing with the price even without his cooperation or collusion. Yeah. So, I mean, coming back to that, you know, you had the Carsonson study that that challenged the findings of the earlier academics. You have this card study that that challenges maybe the ability and the, the properness of them being able to run those 22 or 24 big plants. You know, they used used to have 24 competing. Now you've got four essentially, you know, that are that are running the show. Uh, Bob Taylor has come out with a study that I haven't even gotten all the way through yet, but it's tremendous. I mean, it, it goes back through the history, back to that early 1900s divestiture. He has several different ways to increase competition, but I guess where I'm going with all of this is since the 5014 concept came out, since it was derailed into the compromise concept, we've seen a lot of academia come out and really challenge. Oh, and then the Georgetown study, duh. I mean, there's another study that just recently came out that really challenges AMAs, that they're not all responsible for all of the quality increases that we've seen and it goes right at amas you know they might not be necessary for proper flow through the plants and and 
it's it's a lot. I mean, you get to read in those studies. It's a lot because they're all 30 to 50 pages, but every, every one of them just has the charts and the data and it goes through. And that's something that's, that's totally new that we haven't seen before. You know, we have number one, the congressional interest. Number two, we have these academic studies coming out. And I guess I, I'm kind of hopeful, but I guess I'm, I'm that antitrust guy. I've always kind of felt like that is what it was going to take because I didn't have a lot of faith in a heavily lobbied Congress. And I think that the compromise bill maybe is, is our carrier pigeon message that, yeah, whatever, whatever comes out of Congress isn't going to be much. So we're going to have to find another way. Okay. Well, let's look at that rabbit. <laughs> what What is another way? I mean, other than the Packers of Stockyards Act and getting the USDA to actually enforce the laws that are on the books, what's what's another way? I mean, besides building your own pathway to market and not playing that big Packer game anymore, which, you know, on the individual level, a strong argument can be made for that, but that's just benefiting me. That's not benefiting every cattleman around. That's just benefiting me and some of my neighbors. So how do we flip that script to where we're representing every independent cattleman? I guess, uh, after looking at the last two decades, really, and, and especially since 15. I, I don't see any way forward other than for the average producer who just wants to work and be left alone. If, if, they, if they won't rally at this point on their own behalf, then on behalf of American food security, then I don't think, I think the industry is going to look a lot different in five years than it does today. Let's put it that way. Maybe even in two years, to be honest with you. You know, and I, I just, I think that sounds like a very simple statement, right? It's like, blah, 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 get involved, blah, make the phone calls. But I mean, I, I'm dead serious. And, and, you know, I'm not defeatist. If you ignore me, And the people who are, who are trying to create change in this country, if you just sit back and enjoy the show, right? Because it's a hell of a show. I mean, there's drama <laughs> everywhere you look. In 4K. It, yes. Yeah, exactly. You know, if you just sit back, America is still going to be here. But what's it going to look like? You know, if, if it hasn't all gotten your attention by now, we just sent we're, we're sending what 40 billion to Ukraine now? Yeah, that billion with a B. Yeah. With a B to Ukraine. You know, God bless those people. I, I feel for them, but second most corrupt country on earth. I mean, they've been invaded it, by the most corrupt country on earth. So and, and again, it's it's not the oligarchs that get hurt. Sure, you might you might put sanctions on them and you might put a dent in their fender, right? But oh, you're, you're you confiscated one of my yachts. You know, but but that's where I'm going is that if if we can't look around and see what's going on at this point, maybe the best way to put it is being an 80s kid, I know that I can fail because I saw good, honest, hardworking people fail people that have did a lot made, of stuff right too have they made a mistake here and there yes but there's not a businessman alive that hasn't made a mistake here and there that's why you've got to have good years to carry you through the bad years right yep and uh if if we think that we're going to continue to just barely break even lose a lot make a little because that's what it looks like now you'll make a little bit of money you break even for a while, you lose a whole bunch, then maybe you make a little bit of money again. 
And if we think that we're going to operate in a market like that and wait on the government to bail us out and retain our independence, we're fooling ourselves. You either believe in independent agriculture or you don't. And so to me, it looks like you get involved or you get in there and get you an AMA and you hope that you're damn good and that they'll treat you good because that's where it's going. Or maybe, maybe you've built your place up over four generations to where you can run four or 500 head of cows, maybe a thousand or something like that. Maybe you sell them all down to 50. You send the kids off to get jobs and you just raise 50 calves a year and sell them as freezer beef and market them the best you can, but you're not going to make a living doing that. You know, that's what it comes down to is, do you want the people who grow the food to feed this country to make a living? Or do you want them indentured servants that are filling out all this third party verification stuff to be good global beef producers? And work for less than minimum wage while we're doing it? Yeah. I, I hear you. And I hear you. And that's, it's scary that it's come to it. And, you know, we bought into the whole feed the world myth when we can't even feed our own communities. Like we're, we're doing a really piss poor job of feeding our rural communities. And we need to quit thinking about trying to feed the world in this area of global, in this era of globalization, which is likely coming to an end or is going to be dramatically different in the very, very near future, you know, two to five years. Um, I, I don't know about you guys. We planted a really big garden this year. <laughs> you know, we sent in a stim at $80 billion of money that we don't have to a corrupt country that got invaded by another country. Uh, you know, and then in the same breath, the news stories are about baby food, uh, baby formula shortages. Have you seen that one? Like that one's pretty hey, new. Man, my sister-in-law was just here. She has a baby that eats formula, right? Right. That's weird. There, there again, I say, if, if you if you don't smell the smoke at this point, that, you're, you're trying not to smell the smoke at this point, you know, and it doesn't mean it doesn't mean anarchy. Here's the deal. It means doing one right thing, one right thing, one step at a time, and we can get back there. But we've got to do one right thing. Hey, what's the first right thing we need that we need to do? Well, I mean, in, in terms of cattle. It's it's M cool probably because it's so common sense and it's it affects every consumer across the country. I mean, even these competition issues ultimately can affect all of us. Uh, the American beef consumers should care about competition in the beef industry. They they should, but you know, it's our job to lead as producers. You know, I hear I hear two things a lot from my different senators, representatives. And number one, I hear you you've got to get the consumer on board. You know, there's not enough of you. You guys are a minority of a minority, right? You're you're there's seven or eight hundred thousand cattlemen in the whole United States that are feeding over three hundred million people. You know, with by producing roughly 26 million fed animals they tell me you've got to get the consumer on board and i i agree with that that we do but yet if the cattleman doesn't step up on his own behalf why is a consumer going to do it why do we always look for somebody else to save us that's the question why don't we engage peacefully and save ourselves that's the i guess that's what brings me to do what i do with what limited talent and resource that I have. You know, the other thing that I always hear is you cattle groups have to get along. And I tell them, no, that, that's not what a republic is, man. A republic doesn't mean we all get along. A republic means that we come together and we find a way. And in my mind, that's what we're lacking in this cattle business. And it might be what we're lacking in America as a whole is we can no longer come together in public and sit down and have a discussion and have a back and forth 
everybody's behind their walls lobbing bombs at each other. You know, I've called repeatedly for Phoenix 2.0, a gathering of all the cattle organizations to come together and to get on a stage, but this time to do it in public, to, to put forth their member-driven policy, how they got there, why they want it, what they're doing to get it. Everybody gets a moment and then you open it up to the public to answer the questions because that's where the learning and the progress begins. You have to figure out an interactive public way to get the people who would contend to be the leaders of the industry to defend their policies. I'd love that. I, I might even show up for that. I, I'd want to moderate that discussion. I Evan, you on the stage with uh, Don Schiffelbein, um, forgive me, I don't know, uh, U.S. Cattlemen's Association. They're the other big yeah, ones. Justin Tupper, Brooke, Brooke Miller, you know. I mean, here, here's another thing, too. Some of the people that are engaged in some of these state groups, the inability of our politicians to progress on any of these issues creates a lot of stress out here. And you get these different groups at each other's throats, even though most of us are just little guys that it doesn't matter. And they, you know, just the inability when, when, when the dialogue and the, and the debate cannot occur at the higher level, it creates it at a higher temperature at a lower level. Do you know what I mean? Because I had a guy that was upset with RCAF and RCAF people that were upset with USCA. And I said, hey, wait a minute. Justin Tupper and I can talk back and forth. We don't agree on everything. We disagree like crazy on some things. But you, you've got to be able to come together and to sit down and to have that back and forth and that dialogue. Because that's the first step of getting there. Because a lot of this is misunderstanding and inactivity that's fomented at the top. Shit, it's, it's no different than what goes on in national politics, man. Look at it. You've got black, white, Hispanic, Native American. You've got man, woman, the different genders. And you've got upper class, lower class, middle class. You've got East Coast, West Coast. They just divide us and divide us and divide us and divide us. And as long as we're busy fighting each other, these guys keep sending $40 billion to Ukraine, right? Yep. And God bless, again, God bless the Ukrainians. They need help. But what's what's a javelin missile cost? More than I make in a year. Yeah. It's about, <laughs> I mean, do the math. I mean, does every man, woman, and child in Ukraine need a javelin missile? Is that the answer? I'm guessing... They're going to spend a tiny amount on defense and the rest of it's going to be cream that gets sent back to the United States. Laundry. Humanitarian aid. Yeah. Yeah. You know. There again, I'm, I'm chasing a rabbit. That's okay. There's plenty of them to, plenty of them to look at around here. Yeah, there is. Uh, okay. So what, Well, I guess let's take a different track. You said you were, you know, you've talked to Justin over at USCA. Uh, will Will Don Schiffelbean over at NCBA return your call or have you tried? You know, I haven't tried and I should. I think you should. If you don't have his phone number, I will hook you up. I, I actually, I have it. Uh, he is a friend of a friend, you would say, that, that sent me uh, his number and, and I really should reach out to him. I mean, but, but honestly, we can spend another year talking behind closed doors or whatever. Let's get together and let's do it in public. They believe what they believe. I believe what I believe. Let's, let's get up because maybe all these people that are out here that kind of have their heads down, maybe, maybe they'll see something that they like and it may, maybe it won't be me because I'm not a polished public speaker at all, but you know, it's, We've, we've got to get going here. De delay and dilute, delay and dilute. We're always going to get something done. Uh, USCA, NCBA, and RCAF on the same stage. A couple hours, I bet you guys would find that there is a dramatic amount of common ground of what you're all are trying to work for. 
It's there just, is. Just but, a couple little differences. Let, let's spend 10 minutes on what we agree on and let's spend two hours on what we disagree on because that's where the progress is. Yes. And let's do it as gentlemen to try to set an example because you know what, when I came on as RCAF, just as region three board member, uh, Brian Hansen from Fort Pier held this seat previously. And I said, what advice can you give me? And he said, well, he said, you know, stand up for what you believe in and don't fall into the trap of getting one neighbor fighting with another neighbor. He said, there, you know, you, you, you have to try to find a way to push what you believe is right without just stirring everybody up and dividing everybody. And, you know, I haven't figured that out, but that is about as healthy of a challenge as there could be because, you know, we, we all have to live together in the end. And it's a small world sometimes. Yes. Yep. So, yeah, I'd, I'd love to sit down with Don and, and Justin, you know, that would be very instructive, you know, maybe get Farm Bureau and Farmers Union in there too. Get five on a stage and, and see what happens. That would be pretty epic. Just maybe make, maybe get Mike Calicray to seat in the front row. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right. You ready to get out of here? Yeah, I think so. You know, um, like I say, the compromise bill, if that's really as good as we can get as it's put forward, it's not good enough for me. You know, as I, as I look at the problem and the, the consistent decline of the return to rural America of the consumer beef dollar and how that's only gained steam since 2015, I, I think that we need much more. The, the contract library and the transparency provisions, I think that's all fine, but it's all subject to confidentiality and USDA. And uh, I just don't see it. You know, livestock mandatory reporting itself was a great idea when they began. And by the time it got run through USDA, it was pretty much diluted to where it, it didn't do much good because the most concentrated regions never have to give up any data, the most captive regions. So. Well, if they had to give up data, it'd skew the data and it wouldn't probably look as good as it does. Yeah. That, There's a reason right. why they get those carve outs in the first place. Yep. Did we hit everything that you wanted to hit? I appreciate it. I, I, uh, like I say, I just ran in here from uh, hooking up a fertilizer spreader for my nephew and getting him set up and going. And so it's a little scattered, but I, I enjoy trying to answer questions. It sure makes makes us think. Well, I appreciate your time today. And uh, you know, if anybody wants to find you, you can send them to rcaf.com, labelrbeef.com. Anything else you want me to put in the show notes page? Uh, you know, maybe maybe I could send you the links to those studies that we visited about a little bit and people should look at them themselves. Some of them are really wonky, but uh, a few of them are very readable and kind of a history lesson. I've actually had somebody tell me that they go through the show notes and they actually look at all my links. So there's at least one person out there that looks at the show notes. So I've got to put a little effort into them. So yeah, if you could send those links, that'd be great. It's awesome. I've, I've tried to check you out. We're not into full-blown podcast season yet where I have enough uninterrupted time to listen, but I check out the show notes and I, I think it's great. Well, you'll, there'll be a plenty in the back catalog for you to catch up on when you get tractor time. That sounds super. I, I appreciate it. Well, Brett, thanks for joining me today and uh, gang, have a great week. Yep. Thanks, Brian. <laughs>